let's get going um to, so for today's uh, lecture um we're going to continue where we left off with bayesian uh, learning but just a few reminders before that uh, in terms of what's up what's coming up this week um there is uh, homework 5 is due on canvas uh this is uh, uh, I, I know that uh, i noticed that several of you have started working on it if you haven't uh, please do what it involves is uh, looking at uh, uh, watching a video, which is basically a lecture, and uh, uh, and answering a quiz on Canvas. Um, the, you have to attempt at the quiz uh, like all other <coughs> on Canvas homeworks, and uh, the 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 whole thing is about ensembles. Um, ensembles is really an important and useful idea, so I encourage you strongly uh, encourage you to do this. Um, other than the fact that you should do your homework anyway, but uh, this is a useful thing that uh, uh, provides a practical tool for um, uh, in general. Um, and uh, um, the homework essentially asks you to step through the add a boost algorithm. Um, there was a question on Canvas about uh, should you use uh, natural log or uh, log to the base 10? Um, it's natural log. Uh, in general, most of the time when we use log uh, in ML, we end up using natural log. Uh, also, the add a boost is uh, kind of a special thing because it involves, uh, it, it comes with a theoretical guarantee and the guarantee is built on uh, the natural log. All right, I mean, what I mean, the, the, the proof works on the fact that you're using natural log. Anyway, um, so are there any questions about the quiz? Are there any questions about uh, uh, homework five. How do you calculate Z? That's a good question. Um, so just to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page, remember that uh, uh, the, this was something that I deliberately left slightly underspecified in the lecture. So, uh, so remember, I, what Adaboost does is at every step, we calculate uh, something that's uh, dt. So let's say that we have, I'm, I'm just going to make up numbers here. Um, uh, so, uh, so let's say that we have um, say, uh, two examples. Oh no, two is too, too few. So let's say just like your homework, you have four examples. Let's say we have X1, X2, X3, and X4. Um, and let's say we have some DT. And let's let's pretend that currently the value of DT uh, is uh, something like say 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4. Notice that these four numbers add up to one. And uh, you go through the whole process. You pick a weak classifier and you uh, make an update. Uh, meaning you, you update the Ds and let's say this gets multiplied. So D, uh, I will come to DT plus one afterwards. Let's say in the, inter the, the remember the update looks like DT plus one of I is DT of I times E power uh, minus alpha T Y I H of X I, something like that. But uh, just, uh, uh, let's say just for the fun of it, somehow this number magically ends up being either one or two or a half. So let's say this X1 gets multiplied by two. This divided, this gets divided by two. This gets multiplied by two and this gets divided by two. So you get 0 0.2, 0 0.1. Um, oh, actually, you know what? Let's say this also gets multiplied by two. So 0 0.2, 0 0.1, this gets 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. Now the problem is you can't, this cannot be DT because remember DT is a distribution over data. So you can't just, uh, these things don't add up to one. So what you do is you add them up. So if you add this up, you get 1.7. And so the new, so this is a Z. So it's really the sum of these things. So that the, the, the idea is now you normalize this. So you get 0.2 divided by 1.7, 0.1 divided by 1.7, 0.6 divided by 1.7 and 0.8 divided by 1.7. And uh, now you get a distribution once again. Um, so essentially, 
the z is the sum of all these things over all the examples because dt plus one is one over z times this and i want all these dt's to be equal to uh, add up to one so before doing any normalizing whatever numbers you get you add them up and that gives you your z so i hope that uh, answers your question grant um there's another question how, how do we pick what kind of weak classifiers we use for ensembling are there some that are used more widely than others this is uh, an interesting question and at some level this is also a design question um let me uh, explain so first of all uh, the, the, your uh, weak classifiers um you know the notion of a weak classifier that that terminology is typically used only with adaboost uh, more broadly you just you, you ensemble classifiers uh, adaboost uses uh, the notion of weak classifiers and you boost it up to make it uh, a strong classifier uh, so one collection of uh, classifiers that are very commonly used for uh, uh, for uh, ensembling are decision trees, but more importantly, decision trees of, that are restricted to very, very short depths. In particular, things like decision stumps, which are just uh, depth one decision tree. Um, and uh, this is commonly used. Uh, and and um, another widely used uh, kind of ensemble is uh, a random forest, which once again uses a decision tree. So decision trees are often uh, it, often used for ensembling and they give you really good classifiers. I mean, even though uh, you may hear a lot about the neural networks and deep learning and such things, ensemble trees tend to be pretty good. In fact, near state of the art um, quite often. So they, they, that's one thing. So this is one of the reasons why it's worth, uh, you know, uh, dusting out your old ID3 code in case you want to employ this for your projects. Um, the other kind of thing that I have seen uh, on some being ensemble are, uh, I have recently I have started seeing this trend of uh, new models that are really ensembles of neural networks. So what you do is you train multiple different neural networks um, on the same data and you ensemble, the, the final prediction is really the uh, most common prediction or something like that, a, term, a phrase that, uh, uh, gets used with that in that context is uh, product of experts. Uh, and this is a nice phrase that says, you know, each classifier is an expert and you are kind of integrating them together by uh, multiplying all the probabilities that the classifiers predict. So in theory, any classifier you want, any family of classifiers can be ensemble. But the stuff that I've seen a lot of are uh, neural networks and uh, decision trees. Um, and it's worth thinking about how, uh, what your uh, ensembling, the, the, the weak classifiers or the thing that gets ensembled, what that choice, how that helps or how that hurts. Essentially what you're doing with ensembles is you have a collection of classifiers and you are getting a consensus. By building a consensus between them, you are expanding the hypothesis space. If your original hypothesis space was something, by ensembling them, you are essentially expanding the hypothesis space. So uh, there is a risk of uh, overfitting. So if your weak classifiers are not really weak, uh, if they're really strong, then you might end up overfitting. And this is something that you should be careful about. So uh, the, these are the considerations that you need to have when you're picking classifiers for uh, ensemble. Are there any other questions? Are Adaboost with Perceptron and Adaboost with SCVM, do they count as two different classifiers for the project? They would. In fact, uh, ensembles of things would count as different classifiers. So Adaboost is a meta algorithm. Also in, uh, so yes, they would count as different classifiers for the project. In fact, I would suggest if you want like a very quick and dirty classifier that you want to play with, uh, think about say boosted uh, uh, decision trees, or uh, you can even think about using say, um, um, some sort of uh, uh, random forest or bagging bagged decision trees or bagged perceptron or some things like that. Um, 
So uh, essentially you get this, you can mix and match and they would all count as different classifiers for the project. Because think about it this way, uh, Adabus plus Perceptron is not Perceptron because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, building on, it's a different hypothesis space. Adabus plus SVM is a different classifier because SVM is a different classifier and Adabus plus SVM is using the same hypothesis space as Adabus plus Perceptron but exploring that hypothesis space in a different way. So they are different classifiers. Another uh, useful ensembling trick is you can treat each weak classifier. Imagine that you build uh, trees uh, or decision stumps. You can, and you, let's say you build a thousand of them on your data. You can treat each one of them as a feature extractor and build a perceptron on top of it. Uh, and that's also an ensemble. That uh, is a convenient uh, way to build another uh, an ensemble using the other code that you have. All right, uh, if there are no other questions, I'm going to continue with where we left off in the previous lecture. Uh, just a quick recap of where we were. In the last lecture, oh, uh, can I go over once again, uh, the requirements for the project? Um, There are four different learning algorithms uh, you can't use. So the requirements for the project are, um, you need at least, I'm gonna say greater than four and written algorithms, at least two feature sets, and at most one um, library. So uh, if there's at most one library, that means five of these should have been implemented by yourselves. Uh, two of those could be different feature sets, for example. Yes, six total, In and the dummy doesn't count. So your uh, first milestone uh, for the first milestone had one submission, uh, second milestone has two submissions, and by the third milestone, which is the final one, uh, three submissions. So um, this is plus two and plus three, so two more and three more. Does that uh, clarify? All right, let's go back to the lecture. Um, we were talking about Bayesian learning. And this is another way of asking, um, how, how, another way of defining what's the best hypothesis for a certain data set, for a certain problem. And uh, when we are being Bayesian about it, we are using uh, the probability over the conditional probability over a hypothesis to determine what is the best. And so really uh, we are treating the the, choice of the hypothesis and the choice of our data set as random variables. And we went over this last week and this is where we ended. So I'm going to kind of uh, pick up from here. Um, oh, um, there's another uh, question. Uh, Pre-processing data, I've had to write some custom code to do the processing. Are there better ways like Excel or something with the libSVM format? Uh, so there are certain, uh, I think, uh, scikit-learn allows you to use, uh, has a libSVM reader. Um, another thing you could do uh, is uh, just convert your data into a CSV file and load it into Excel if you want to do something like that. Um, I personally, I have not used Excel with the libSVM format simply because if you have 10,000 features, most of the numbers are zero. For example, with the bag of words, it doesn't really uh, seem to help. But uh, the, if you want to go from the libSVM format to something that uh, Excel or uh, something like that reads, then you might have to go through CSV. Uh, you might have to write some code to convert your libSVM uh, format into a CSV file. Um, but uh, the, the format is simple enough that uh, the custom code usually does a reasonable job. All right, um, so we would like to uh, find a classifier H that is the most probable. In other words, we want to look at the conditional probability of a hypothesis given the data set. 
This is the this is the posterior probability using the terminology that we saw in the previous lecture. This is the probability that given that the data set D is the one that we observe, given that this is the one that we observe, what's the probability that H is the true hypothesis? Um, and uh, like I said uh, before in the last week, the key insight that we are using um, with uh, Bayesian learning is that everything here is a, a random variable. Uh, D is the event that this particular data set is the one that we observed. Uh, and H is the event that uh, this particular hypothesis is the correct one. And once we have this probabilistic criterion, once we can you know, write down this probability, we can do interesting things with it. But uh, how do we write down this probability? We use Bayes' rule. So Bayes' rule kicks in because we have, uh, uh, you know, we are talking about a conditional probability. So P of H given D is um, P of D given H times P of H divided by P of D. What I've done here is just blindly apply the Bayes' rule, but now we can start interpreting these different components. The first one is the probability of the hypothesis, the prior probability of the hypothesis. You can think of this as background knowledge. What do we expect the hypothesis to have been without seeing any data? In the absence of any information, if you don't, if you don't have any prior uh, information about the hypothesis, then this could just be the uniform distribution. Now, if you look at only these two highlighted components, so what it's saying is before you saw any data, this is your belief about the hypothesis. And after you see data, this is the belief about the hypothesis. These two uh, things are modulated, are connected by this expression here. It's P of P given H divided by P of B. I'm going to essentially ignore this denominator because it doesn't depend on H. So what we have is that the posterior probability, the probability of seeing the hypothesis of the hypothesis, sorry, the probability of the hypothesis being the best, the correct one given the data is the prior times this expression here, the problem, the way, one way of reading this is, uh, what is the, so the, that's the, the middle term, the likelihood. The one way of reading this is what's the probability that this data set or this data, this example maybe um, is observed given that the hypothesis is H. Think of it as like a generative process. What is the process? What is the probability that this particular hypothesis could have generated the data uh, D? This is the likelihood of seeing the data. So what we have here is that the posterior probability P of H given D is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior. Um, now, so far I have, uh, I have just done some symbol manipulation and um, talked about how these things are connected, but the general strategy for using, uh, uh, for Bayesian learning is we care about this quantity here we will write down closed form expressions of this, exp this thing and this thing. And uh, when we want to find the classifier or the best model for a data set, we have by writing down these two expressions, we will uh, set up an optimization problem because we want to find the classifier that has the highest posterior. Instead, we'll or equivalently, we'll find the classifier that's the highest product of these two terms. And that's going to be the standard process. There are assumptions that we'll have to make along the way to make this work. But uh, in some sense, every time we employ the Bayes rule for class, any, any, every time we employ a, a Bayes rule for learning a classifier, this is the process that we'll do. So in particular, oh, um, how would a good, how would a hypothesis generate the data? P of H, D given H, seems like a fairly unintuitive thing. This is where we have to make some assumptions and we'll see uh, at least three examples of this, uh, uh, of how to apply this idea. Um, I'm hoping that we'll finish two of these today. And uh, on Thursday, we'll employ exactly the same idea for uh, building up logistic regression. So we, by the end of this week, we would have seen this uh, process three times, but I want you to keep this, uh, relationship in mind because essentially everything that we will do next builds on top of this. And uh, um, we'll have to make assumptions about this because this is in some sense what we assume the prior, prior probability is. And we'll have to make assumptions about this, about how we believe the hypothesis generates the example. This is, uh, um, uh, this is a 
this is another way of the, uh, uh, this is a modeling assumption, just like uh, we will see, this is a modeling assumption, just like uh, how, uh, an assumption about say, the data set, we believe that the data set is linearly separable. That's a modeling assumption. So this is another uh, way in which a modeling assumption manifests itself. Um, it's just kind of cloaked inside this language of probability. But uh, we'll kind of work out a couple of examples. So in particular, once we have an expression like this, oh, by the way, this denominator is simply what's the probability that the data is observed. Once we have uh, this kind of a setup, we can ask, um, what is the best classifier given the data? This notion of what's the best classifier given the data, what's the, uh, uh, what's the classifier that has the highest posterior probability has a name. It's called maximum a posteriori estimation, maximum the, the, the classifier that has the maximum posterior probability. With a small assumption, we will also uh, look at a variant called maximum likelihood estimation. So first let's look at the maximum a posteriori. Given a data set, the maximum a posteriori hypothesis, which is uh, most often just called MAP. The MAP hypothesis is simply the one that maximizes the posterior probability. This is the posterior probability. So the MAP hypothesis is simply the one that maximizes the posterior probability of the hypothesis given the data set. Um, but that's exactly the same uh, by Bayes rule. This is exactly the same as the one that's maximizing um, uh, this expression here, P of a, D given H times P of S divided by P of P. But notice that the denominator is essentially, the maximization is over H and the denominator does not contain any H. So it does not influence the maximization. It only changes the score. It only changes the, the number that we are uh, 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 computing, but it does not change the uh, relative ordering of the hypothesis. So we can essentially drop that because we only, if we only care about the, uh, the, the hypothesis that has the maximum posterior probability, that's equivalent to saying, I'm going to solve this maximization problem. I'm maximizing the product of the likelihood times the prior. So I want to find the hypothesis that maximizes this particular product. And then again, as I said before, we have to come up with uh, uh, you know, concrete definitions of what these expressions look like uh, in functional form so that we can actually do this optimization. So the posterior is the product of the, is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior, and this is what we are going to maximize. Now, there are two different kinds of assumptions that we have to make in order to set up a maximum a posteriori uh, uh, estimation pro, uh, or you know, set up learning as uh, map. The first one is we need to understand how the data set came into existence uh, if the hypothesis was something. This is a modeling choice. We also need to have some uh, preference over hypotheses. Um, maybe for some reason we prefer some kinds of hypotheses over the others. So if I want, if, if you want to be Bayesian about learning decision trees, for example, the prior probability of the hypothesis might depend on the depth of the tree. So in the absence of any information, I prefer trees that are shorter. So P of H would be higher for shorter trees. But sometimes we may have no such um, intuition. Sometimes we may have no such preference. We just want to, uh, you know, in the, we, in the absence of any information, we have no reason to believe this hypothesis or that is more preferred. In other words, in, term, in the language of probability, what that means is we have no way of knowing what this value is or equivalently, all hypotheses are equally likely without having seen data. P of H is essentially the uniform distribution. So by the way, uh, uh, that, before we go into that, uh, a brief um, reminder for map hypothesis, we want to find the classifier that maximizes P of D given H times P of H, but in the absence of any information, the prior and prior is, uh, we, we know nothing about it. So essentially we are assuming that this quantity here is uniform. P of H is uniform or P of H I equals P of H J. Essentially P of H is a constant. 
if p of h is a constant, it is not going to affect which uh, classifier gets chosen. So we essentially can choose the classifier based on only p of d given h. p of d given h, remember, is called the likelihood term. So this simplification is called maximum likelihood estimation. So this expression, uh, the, 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 this way of finding a classifier, um, uh, max over all hypothesis p of d given h is the maximum likelihood uh, uh, approach for finding a classifier. So these are the two, in some sense, most commonly used criteria for choosing a hypothesis. Maximum a posteriori or map is the one where we uh, have a likelihood term and a prior term over a hypothesis and we find a classifier that maximizes that product. Maximum likelihood estimation says the prior probability of all hypotheses is uniform, it's an assumption. And as a result, we just have the second term, P of D given H. So we just, uh, sorry, not the second term, the, uh, the first term in the likely in, in the map estimation, P of D given H, and that's all we have. So these are the two Bayesian criteria for finding a hypothesis. In practice, we, almost never directly maximize these expressions by themselves. Uh, we end up maximizing the log likelihood and the log of this expression. So we, you will see this uh, term called, mac the, a, so we can maximize, ah, my pencil is starting to, after being reasonably good for the entire semester, the writing device is complaining. So we want to maximize log likelihood or sometimes you might see instead of max you can take the negative of this and you minimize the negative log likelihood so some you might see uh, abbreviations like nll or just ll and these are all just the log likelihood or the negative log likelihood so when people say i want to minimize uh, negative log likelihood essentially what they are saying is they are doing maximum likelihood estimation and this uh, uh, has managed to find its way into uh, 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 some libraries also. So you will see uh, some things like NLL sometimes. So uh, there's a question. Given a hypothesis, we are finding the probability of the sample data, uh, essentially. But uh, that's just the term inside the maximization. And then among all hypotheses, we are finding the one that maximizes the probability of the sample data. So we are given a data set and we want to know what is the hypothesis that would have made this particular data set that I have in my hand uh, the most likely, uh, sorry, what's the classifier that would have made this particular data set come into existence? What's the most likely classifier for this particular data set showing up? So effectively what we have here is a collection of maximization problems or if you're uh, being if you want to put a negative in front of it, a collection of minimization problems. So naively, we have this notion of a brute force map learner. Brute force map learner is a useless thing. It's just a conceptual device. Um, if you have a hypothesis set H, and let's say it, uh, this should be H in H. I thought I got all of them. Um, so if you have a hypothesis space, and I want to find a classifier, the best one, what you do is first, make an assumption for this and this, P of D given H and P of H, essentially a modeling assumption and come up with a prior distribution over the hypothesis. And you compute the posterior probability, which is this expression, you compute the posterior probability of every single hypothesis and you find the one that has the highest one, you enumerate each one and find the highest one. In practice, of course, you know, uh, calcul doing this uh, exhaustively is uh, uh, laughably, uh, 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 intractable thing because you know uh, imagine that we want to find all uh, if your hypothesis space is the set of all linear classifiers we can't enumerate all of them uh, let alone uh, find the one that's the highest so we'll have to uh, set up other optimization problems or we have to convert this into a new mathematical optimization but conceptually this is what we are doing essentially we are enumerating every single classifier and then finding the one that maximizes this expression or equivalently maximizes this expression. Um, the rest of uh, this lecture is really, uh, how do we take this 
really difficult to compute problem, uh, namely enumerating every classifier and finding the one that has the highest probability. How do we take this problem and convert it into something that we can actually solve in a reasonable time? So uh, to, set, to set this up, I'm going to now show you two examples. The first one is a, a case where uh, uh, we will look at Bernoulli trials and it's, it's a situation where the maximization is actually trivial. It's so simple, we can actually work it out on this slide. And the second one uh, is uh, we will use maximum likelihood estimation in the context of the a normal distribution for linear regression. And we'll see how to solve that problem. So let's start off with uh, maximum likelihood estimation for with a Bernoulli trial. So we are, I'm doing maximum likelihood estimation because maximum a posteriori essentially is uh, uh, just adding one extra term, which is this P of H here. But uh, for MLE, what we have is just, we need to define the hypothesis space. So we are, ima imagine you're given a data set. You're given a data set and told, find a classifier. First, of course, you need to define the hypothesis space. What kind of, uh, uh, what family of functions does this classifier come from? And you need a model that says, how, the, how is the data generated if the classifier was some H? Instead of a classifier or instead of anything that might look like machine learning, I'm going to start off. But the first example we'll encounter is a rather simple one. Uh, it may, it may, it's a laughably simple example. Imagine that uh, after this class, your uh, CEO of some startup hires you for your first consulting job. This company that uh, makes bulbs and the CEO needs to know what's the probability that these bulbs are faulty. And of course, uh, uh, you need to first know what, I mean, um, just not even knowing anything about the bulbs, we can't make any judgment, so we need to collect some information. So first thing we need to ask is, are they essentially identical in a statistical sense? Are they identical? Uh, what I mean by that is, are they all identically distributed? Uh, is the fault, is the fact that a bulb is faulty or not identically distributed? And if that's the case, then we need we can set up an experiment. Um, what you do is uh, you try out a hundred light bulbs, and if eighty of them work, um, and twenty don't, you know that the probability of failure is 0.2. That seems like an obvious thing because it's uh, you've tried hundred experiments, and twenty of them didn't work. So the fact that uh, uh, you know essentially one in five light bulbs have has uh, the probability of failure is one in five. But here's the question that's uh, interesting. How do you know this answer? How do you know that the probability of failure is one in five from this experiment? So the data that we have is we have some uh, elements that work, some uh, light bulbs that work, and some light bulbs that don't. From this, how do you prove that the probability is 0.2? Can someone take a stab? In fact, uh, uh, I know that there are 50 of you, but I keep seeing the same names there are about 50 of you regularly in the class, but I keep seeing the same names in the chat. So maybe someone who's not uh, chatted before uh, can type up an answer. Why is the probability of uh, uh, failure in this case 0.2? So the probability, okay, so there are a couple of suggestions. Um, probability of failure, so this 0.2 is essentially a number of failures, which is 20, divided by the number of failures plus number of success, which is 20 plus 80, which is uh, 0.2. Um, and I know this is a reasonable thing, um, and there are two suggestions. Uh, two other suggestions, which are kind of in the same block, um, this set is large enough and uh, that we can assume that uh, this 0.2 is a reasonable estimate of the true probability. So this is just an estimate. But the question was not about why. So this is a perfectly valid answer. All your answers are perfectly valid. Um, but the question was, there's something more. Why did you think to even do this division? Why do you divide 0.20 by 100 uh, why is it a mathematically valid thing to do? What are the assumptions that are in play in order to justify this expression? There is an IID assumption, but that assumes the D, the distribution. 
um, that there is definitely an IID, and that's really what this this tells us. All they are all identical, but why is this division the right operation? Why not do something more complicated? So, uh, I think the suggestion, the last suggestion that came up, that the bulb can only fail or not fail, is a valid assumption, and uh, that's the starting point. And Brett had uh, the right answer. It's the most likely hypothesis given the data. Let's work it out. Suppose we have um, all bulbs are uh, the the trials are all independent and identically distributed, uh, which means whether this bulb fails and whether this bulb fails does not uh, affect each other. That's you know a reasonable assumption uh, starting point. Maybe they are all the you know maybe there are issues with that, but let's assume that the probability of failure is p. So probably that any single bulb fails is p, which means the probability of success is one minus p. Suppose we have seen a data set. The data set that we have seen is that uh, 80 things, 80 bulbs work and 20 don't. That means the problem, uh, I think I have um, written this incorrectly. Um, so it should be, so the, let me write it correctly and then get back to this. So the, prob the data is 80 work and uh, 20 don't. That means uh, if this, if the, pro if the true probability of failure is P and I see that there is a technical objection to the IID and I'm going to ignore it. Yes, you're right. But uh, um, for the purposes of uh, the class, let's uh, assume that they're all independent. So knowing that these things are all independent, how, uh, uh, how, how could this particular data set have been generated? How could this particular observation have been generated? One way in which, the, the way in which it would have been generated is, you know, we can ask what's the probability of seeing this data set, this observation. There are 80 of them that uh, work, which means you choose 80 of them. And uh, this is a mistake, so let me do the correct one here. Times one minus P, all of these work. So one minus P power 80, the probability of seeing this is, um, there are uh, 80 successes, so one minus P power 80 times P power 20, which is uh, 20 failures. This is the probability of observing this particular data set for any value of P. So uh, the probability of the data set given P is this expression here. Notice that this is a function Ignore the fact that this is a probability and all that. This is some function in P. If the goal of learning is to find the maximum likelihood estimate, I want to find the P that maximizes this expression or equivalently that maximizes the thing in the box. So I want to find the probability that maximizes uh, uh, this uh, expression because that's the, that's the probability of having the likelihood of seeing the data. The most likely, so, once you see this, we can set up a problem that's uh, you know just mathematical optimization. What's the most likely value for uh, this particular observation? In fact, let's solve this thing. So we need to find the most likely uh, value of P for this particular observation. In general, I'm going to set up a learning problem here. Let's say we have A light bulbs that don't work and B that work. The best probability is simply the R max among all P of uh, P of D given H here. H is simply the number P. Um, we never work with likelihoods. We work with log likelihoods all the time. So it's simply the R max of log of the likelihood expression. We saw the likelihood thing before. So I generalized it here. It's uh, instead of 100 choose 80. So we have A that don't work. So out of those 100, a, uh, out of A plus B trials, A of them don't work. So if the, you first choose uh, A plus B, choose uh, A out of A plus B. A of them don't work. So it is P power A. We have A failures times one minus P power B. I can take the log of this whole expression. The first term here is independent, um, is independent of P. So it doesn't matter in the R max. So effectively this uh, maximizing that uh, product is identical to maximizing a power p, uh, a log p plus b log one minus p. 
So essentially, I have set up a maximization problem here. I need to solve this optimization problem. So let's uh, solve this concretely. So I want to have some function. I'm going to call that f of p is a log p plus b log 1 minus p. I want to maximize this function. I can take the uh, derivative of this p minus b divided by 1 minus p. And I can set this to 0. If I set this to 0, I have a divided by p equals b divided by 1 minus p. I can multiply both sides. Uh, you know, I can simplify this expression. a minus a p equals b p and pull all the p terms on one side. So I get a equals. So p is a divided by a plus p. So what I have here is this expression on top is not ident equal to, but it's uh, some log likelihood uh, plus some constants. I've gotten rid of the constants, which means, and I'm setting, taking the derivative and setting to zero. You can convince yourself that this is a maximum, not a minimum, which means this expression here is the P that maximizes the likelihood of the data, which is uh, A failures and B success. This expression P maximizes the likelihood of the data. And this is why the in the example that we saw, 20 divided by 20 plus 80 was the right thing to do. Keep in mind, this is the, the important thing that led to this whole thing, that this being correct is an assumption of how the data is uh, being generated. So there was a question, why did I drop the n choose k part? So, I dropped this expression here because, so in fact, let me keep the n choose k part and rework this thing. Um, so let me uh, move the whole thing down. So the expression that we originally had was a plus b, oh, choose a, p power a, one minus p power b. But I, when I take the log of this, it's log a, plus b choose, ah, I keep writing divide, a plus a log p plus b log one minus p. Let's call, now if I, instead of f of p being this expression, I can check f of p is this expression, so let's change this. But once again, the derivative, so the so first expression is independent of p, so the derivative doesn't change. So essentially, it's, we are adding a constant. As far as the optimization problem is concerned, it's a constant. And that's why it doesn't change. This is something that we will do almost like uh, um, by second nature. Um, uh, going ahead, any term, when we are maximizing things or minimizing things, any uh, expressions that are constants keep getting tossed out if they are additive. Um, so here, this is an additive constant. Um, uh, so uh, you know it, it doesn't matter. Similar, similarly, if it's a positive number and we are maximizing things and you multiply by that, it's not going to change. So what we have here is, you know, we've taken something very, very simple, which was this thing. We have A successes and B failures. And how do you know what's the um, uh, probability of success or the probability of failure? We've taken something very simple and essentially given a formal reason for why the intuitive answer is uh, a reasonable one. Along the way, we had to make a few assumptions. The first assumption was IID. The second assumption is this, uh, by IID, I mean that every trial is independent and identically distributed. The second assumption that we made is actually the nature of that distribution, namely uh, that this, uh, the, pro the failures and successes are essentially Bernoulli trials. The probability of failure is P, the probability of success is one minus P. And this is why the whole thing works. Had you changed that assumption, you might have ended up with a different uh, answer. So uh, let's kind of recap all the things that we have seen so far. Um, we looked at a concrete example of maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, we saw how we can make a modeling assumption about the hypothesis, in which case, in this case, it's a Bernoulli trial. And we saw an example of how log likelihoods gets maximized. And 
we we also saw something that uh, I didn't mention before, which is in the end, after going through all this process, we end up with an answer that you could have come up with without doing any effort, which uh, often does happen with uh, uh, some of these uh, Bayesian methods. It's essentially a clean justification for why the intuitive answer is the right one. Um, another thing that we saw, which is a, a bit of an anomaly, is we have solved this maximization problem entirely on paper. We didn't actually call an optimizer. We did not use stochastic gradient descent or anything because we could just take the derivative, set it to zero and solve for P. This is an anomaly. This is not going to happen more often. Uh, the, the, the more uh, common situation is we'll have an optimization problem of this kind where we don't have a closed form solution. And as a result, we have to have this algorithmic process. Uh, in particular, we'll use some sort of a gradient-based optimization problem, opti uh, gradient-based optimizer uh, for solving uh, this, uh, uh, this problem. This is an anomaly. So, ah, so now let's maybe revisit all the terms that we saw um, using this, uh, this simple example. So first of all, P best, so there's a question, is P best the posterior or the likelihood? It's neither. P best serves the role of your model. So uh, you, the analogy here would be the hypothesis space is all, is any number from zero to one. The hypothesis, any single hypothesis is the, the, the model, the probability. P best is the best hypothesis. P of D given H is the likelihood. The posterior distribution is not here at all. Implicitly we are, by doing maximum likelihood estimation, we are assuming that all, the, all P are allowed. In other words, P of H, the prior, is a constant, is a, is, sorry, is a uniform distribution over the set zero to one. Um, the other, uh, in, in, and once, because, if, let me write this down, is uniform. If P of H is uniform, all we have is the maximum likelihood estimation. And that's why we are, uh, um, the, the P best is actually the maximum likelihood estimate for uh, the best model. If you had if you had some reason to believe that P of H was not uniform, if you had, for example, some reason to believe that uh, somehow this hypothesis space, certain uh, probabilities for success or failure were more plausible because of some reason, let's say that you had a uh, you had some prior knowledge to uh, believe that this whole process is very defective. So uh, even though this particular set of experiments suggest that on, there were only 20 failures, actually something else, uh, the number of failures should be a lot more. You would encode that in the form of this prior distribution. You, uh, For those of you who know this, a reasonable prior would be a beta distribution over the hypothesis. If you've not seen that before, don't worry about it. But uh, this is like a tiny, tiny example where a lot of the different pieces of uh, Bayesian learning show up. And yet we end up with an answer that you could have come up with without knowing Bayesian learning. But uh, Ola, does that uh, answer your uh, question? And are there other questions? What happens if in our experiments, we never encounter a certain situation. There will be problems with log. Anytime we're taking any sort of, uh, oh, first of all, we don't have any problems with taking log because we're taking log of probability. Um, uh, I mean, symbolically it's allowed, uh, but the question still holds. What happens if we encounter zeros? What if, for example, you, you instead of 100 trials, let's say we had only 10 trials. This is, uh, a good question that's a good segue into something that uh, I've been wanting, I, 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 it'll probably come up in a much later lecture, but I'll mention it anyway. So let's say we have uh, 10 trials 
And let's say we have uh, uh, zero successes and all 10 failure. Can we say with confidence that the probability of failure is one? Can we say this? I would argue not necessarily because we, you know you have only 10 trials. Maybe the 11th one's a success. Maybe the probability of failure is high, but you can't guarantee that the probability of failure is one. Uh, so this is where uh, we need to somehow go outside of what the data tells us. We have to essentially introduce something called smoothing. Um, smoothing would involve adding, say, maybe the probability of failure is 10 divided by 10, that's one, but maybe you add 10 divided by 10 plus some small epsilon. So it's 0.999 something. So how do you know this epsilon? Effectively, what this epsilon is serving is it's serving the role of a prior or it's coming from a certain prior. It's saying, I really don't think anything is uh, zero probable uh, or hundred percent probable. So allocate a small amount of probability even for things that you have never seen in the data. So in the absence of any data, I would like certain uh, classifiers to be, even in the absence of any data, I would like certain models to be rejected. In particular, the probability being zero. So this is called smoothing. And uh, when we are building probabilistic models and using maximum likelihood estimation the way we have done it, usually we have to do some sort of smoothing. So uh, smoothing is a, a useful trick. It has a nice explanation from the maximum uh, a posteriori perspective, or you can just think of it as a hack if you want, where we just don't want to have um, infinities and zeros in our, uh, uh, in our uh, code. But that's a good uh, question. Uh, let me now, uh, as you're thinking of more questions, let me now um, go walk through another example. Uh, this involves using the normal distribution using uh, with maximum likelihood estimation. So once again, uh, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, uh, with maximum likelihood estimation, we want to, we are given a data set and we want to find a classifier or a model more generally that maximizes the likelihood of the data. We need to have first an assumption of the hypothesis space. In the light bulbs example, the hypothesis space was the set of all numbers between zero and one, essentially the probability of uh, uh, failure. And we need a model that generates, that decides how the data is generated given the hypothesis. We, the model we had was every light bulb is independent of all the others. So we can essentially, the, the way it's generated is um, the, uh, each light bulb uh, can either be a success or a failure with probability P or one minus P. And uh, you use the style, you know, you basically compute that probability and that's the model that says how the data is generated. We're going to instantiate the exact same things for a different setting. Um, so instead of uh, uh, the single uh, probability, let's say um, the hypothesis consists of real valued functions uh, in the vectors, uh, uh, vectors uh, the hypothesis is defined by some vector. Let's say uh, the input is, uh, so let's say we have a regression problem. The inputs are um, vectors in D dimensions and the output is a real number. So we need, we need some way in which we convert this real number, uh, uh, sorry, this vector into a real number. We've already encountered this before in the context of least squares regression. Let's see how, um, how a Bayesian would approach the same task. Suppose, now we are, this is where I'm assuming a model about how the data might have been generated. Suppose the data was generated in the following way. Every example is drawn randomly, let's say uniformly at random uh, from the space of all examples. Um, and the true function, there is some true function f that gets applied to this example um, to get f of x. This is the Oracle function. Unfortunately, we don't have access to this function. And even more unfortunately, before we actually see a labeled example, which is this uh, uh, X, Y pair, before we see a labeled example, there's some noise E that gets added to this prediction. So what we end up observing is not the value of the function, 
but instead we end up observing the data set that we observe gets is pairs of xi and yi where the f of x the label the number that's assigned is corrupted with some noise but thankfully let's assume that the noise is not uh, um, you know uh, arbitrary it's drawn according to some unknown gaussian distribution with zero mean so most of the time uh, we'll be getting uh, points that are essentially uh, you know labels or uh, the 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 y i's that are centered around the true uh, value f of x because the mean is zero and there's some uh, standard deviation we don't know what this we, we, we don't know what that gosh is so i mean there's no reason why the data should have been generated this way but suppose the data were generated this way can we say something about uh, the the can we set up a learning problem here in order to set up a learning problem we need to have a training set let's say that uh, this process is apply, uh, applied m times to generate a training set in other words uh really what we are doing is we are given m training examples of the form xi comma yi xi's are vectors and yi's are real numbers and we are making an assumption that this training data was generated according to this process here an example is drawn randomly uh, the true function is applied to it and then it's per the value is perturbed with some gaussian noise and this is how we have come up with our training set this is a generative model now uh once we have this uh, our goal is now to find an approximation of f what we would like is to find some function h that mimics f as much as possible uh, modulo the noise so let's say we have some hypothesis h i would like to know what's the probability that this particular example yi the label yi was generated by the hypothesis h applied to an example xi remember that uh, this particular uh, uh, if even if h was the true hypothesis we need not have seen uh, so even if h was the true hypothesis y i need not be equal to uh, h i or h of x i because um, the because of this noise so every example is going to incur some error and we could ask what is this error the error is simply the difference between these two things um yi minus f of xi remember the true process that generated yi is yi uh plus some error i so even if h was equal to f there would be some gap between y and h and that gap is the uh, the error in the prediction um so we can ask what is the error for each example it's the difference between y and h now we know something about this error if f was equal to h this error is simply a gaussian because we made that assumption so we can assume that this particular error is from a gaussian distribution with zero mean and standard deviation some sigma we don't know what it is and we can compute the probability of observing this data point if h was the true function so it's a standard gaussian uh, thing so now this is how one particular data point was generated if h was the true hypothesis the probability of y given x is this expression here um in the important thing to note it is uh, e power yi minus h of xi square uh, and there's all these other terms we have this is for this is the story of one example we have not one but an entire data set of m examples of this kind this is how one example was generated we can ask how was m how were how, how how did my entire data set come into existence the pro each example in my data set was generated independently using the same process um let's pretend that the p of x is uh, uniform because i don't really that, that that's not in our control so every example is generated independently from this process so the probability of the data set given the hypothesis p of d given h is uh, you know because every example is independent p of d given h is uh, simply the product over all expressions of p of uh, the data set simply consists of xi yi so it's simply pro the product over this xi yi uh, the probability of that given that the hypothesis was h um i don't care about p of x so i'm just going to 
uh, remove that uh, thing. So the probability, the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis is proportional to the product of all over all examples, uh, the probability of yi given h comma xi, which is exactly this expression that we saw before. Now, one of the annoying things about this uh, whole process is um, it's actually rather simple, but there's so much notation. So I'm going to pause here and I would like to say, uh, see if there are any questions. Because even though the underlying idea is not terribly hard, there is some notational barrier that we have to jump through. Um, and uh, I don't know why the, I don't know how the, how we can get past the barrier. So there's a question, why are these two, two things proportional? So the reason is, um, I'm gonna just work with the, the expression on top. So P of Y comma H, no Y comma X given H is P of Y given X comma H times P of X given H. If, if I assume that this quantity P of X given H, like if I assume that X is independent of H, because the way in which the examples are chosen doesn't depend on the function that is labeling them, then this expression does not depend on, um, on the hypothesis. So the only term that depends on the hypothesis is this thing, P of Y given X comma H, which is just this. So really there should have been P of X I given H, but I'm assuming that that's a constant. And because that's a constant, I can drop it. I can't put an equals there because I've dropped a multiplicative factor. So I'm going to say it's proportional to. Does that, uh, uh, there's another question. Do we need to pick the Sigma term? Ah, um, we will see very soon that uh, as long as we assume that the Sigma is a fixed number, um, uh, we will, we can actually get rid of it. It's not going to matter. And by the way, Kirk, this is an answer to your earlier question. How does, how do we get P of D given H? Essentially it depends on the question. It depends on the task. For every task, we make this kind of a rather elaborate assumption about how the data might have been generated uh, like this here. And that automatically leads to uh, a, an exp a closed form expression for P of D given H. Um, and uh, sometimes this this way in which uh, we the, the data is generated, it's sometimes called the generative story. Um, it's a modeling assumption. There are, there are assumptions that go into place here to kind of uh, justify why this expression is correct. Of course, like all assumptions, it may be wrong. And like all assumptions, uh, it may be helpful. Are there other questions? Think of more questions while uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to uh, move ahead. So our goal, so what we have done so far is, let me kind of uh, recap what we have seen so far. What we, we in this context, we wanted to uh, apply the maximum likelihood criterion for a regression problem. We made an assumption that the data is generated by taking a true function f, perturbing it with some noise that is Gaussian and has zero mean and uh, uh, each example is generated by picking some random X, applying this uh, true function, applying the perturbation, and that's how you get the Y. And we have this pairs of X comma Y. And uh, now because the perturbation is Gaussian, we can ask what's the probability of Y given H. It is in some sense, the probability of the error if H was the true function and it's deterministic. The only uncertainty here is because of the error and it's Gaussian. So that's how we get this P of Y given H as uh, this Gaussian expression. Each example in the data set is independent. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the, we can simply take the, the, the probability, the likelihood of the data, which is this expression here is simply the product over all uh, express all P of Y given H comma X. So there's a question, what is the, why is the numerator uh, of this form? The numerator is in this form because the error uh, it's really the probability. Okay, let me, yes. So remember the error is a Gaussian. Let's call this thing Z, Zi. So 
we are assuming that vi is coming from the normal distribution with zero mean and uh, sigma some standard deviation and uh, that the the air, this expression here is really probability of z i because th this quantity here is z square z i square if the the uh, the it's z i square if it were if the mean was not zero then it would have been z i minus some mean square but we assume that the error has zero mean so that's why we have the, this is the standard gaussian expression so remember the gaussian uh, probability the mass function looks like one one over sigma root two pi e power the um, z i minus mean some mean square divided by two sigma square mean is zero and so th th this but you, it's good that you see the connection to least squares because that's what the, the we'll, we're going to take advantage of that. Okay, so now what we have is um, we have written down the likelihood function. So we've written down this expression here and all that's left is to throw this into some optimizer to get the maximum likelihood estimate. So the maximum likelihood estimate for your hypothesis is simply the, the hypothesis that maximizes P of D given H or equivalently the hypothesis that maximizes the product over all examples. We will encounter this by the way often, this product over all examples. Product over all examples of P of Y given H comma X. Um, I can just plug in this expression here. So that's, uh, this is just uh, mechanical. And uh, now the goal is to maximize this expression. How do we maximize this expression? Any thoughts, how do we, what can we do next? How can we make our life a little bit simpler? If I have to give you, if I have to solve this problem, you can use a computer algebra system, but let's say that we don't have a computer algebra system. How do we, uh, let's say we are the computer algebra system. How do we maximize the expression? The answer is log likelihood. Anytime you see a big product that you need to maximize, you always take the log. So take the log, it will simplify the thing quite a bit. So you'll get log of this first term. So let me use a different pen. The log of this first term goes here and e power minus something, the log of that is simply the minus something. So you get this whole thing is inside the summation. Log of the first term minus the second term, the e minus yi minus hi square divided by two sigma square. This is fantastic. Because notice that the first term really does not depend on H. It's just a constant that keeps getting added up every time. So we can essentially get rid of that. And I move the minus outside. So I get arg max over H, the sum over this expression here. Uh, sorry, the negative sum over. Maximizing a negative function is simply the same as minimizing the original function. And also notice that I'm multiplying by sigma all the time but sigma doesn't matter uh, because it's a constant. It doesn't depend on H and it's just a multiplicative term that keeps coming up. So I can get rid of that also. So what we have here is the maximum likelihood estimate is simply the hypothesis that minimizes the sum of the squared errors. The most likely hypothesis in over the data is the hypothesis that minimizes the sum over the squared errors provided the noise is zero mean, uh, is a Gaussian, uh, is a zero mean Gaussian with even an unknown standard deviation. I don't know what the noise, the noise distribution is other than the fact that it has zero mean and it's not, it's a, uh, it has some standard deviation. So the most likely hypothesis is simply the function that minimizes this expression. Now notice that I have not made any assumptions about what functional form H takes. H could be, for example, a neural network. H could be a linear classifier. H could be any class of functions. If H was a linear, sorry, not a linear classifier, but a linear function, a linear regressor, if H was a linear regressor, regressor, then we get an expression that looks like this. Minimize the sum over all examples of yi minus w transpose xi square. We've seen this before. This is essentially the probabilistic interpretation for least mean square regression or least square regression. Um, are there any questions before we 
kind of touch upon that point. Are there any questions about this, the whole, uh, um, these steps that we have done and uh, any uh, about the simplification and so on? A lot of, uh, you know, th this is our second example of uh, using the maximum likelihood estimate. And notice that unlike the first one, we did not go ahead and solve the problem, but instead essentially brought it to a, a state where we can, someone else can solve it, an optimizer can solve it. Um, the other thing to note here is this procedure is very, very, uh, it's almost a template for how maximum likelihood estimation gets applied. So first, we need to figure out some closed form expression for p of y given h comma x. So this is this is going to be the expression that we will. Uh, the, the, this is the, the way in which the label gets created given the model. Once you have that, we write down the likelihood of the data. The likelihood of the data is going to be simply the product of the likelihoods of each example, because we assume that every example is independent and identically distributed. And then you do work out some um, uh, algebra, but typically or almost invariably, the first thing that you do is take a log of this expression of uh, the thing in the uh, box. That way you convert your product into a sum and then you essentially weed out any constants that might exist like this thing here and this thing here, and you end up with an expression at which point you have a choice. Either it's really not a choice. If you have a, you're, you're, you have a simplified problem and you can either, you, your problem might be so simple that uh, you, know, you, can, you can take derivatives on paper and solve the problem. And this it turns out does happen, for example, for uh, say, uh, certain versions of naive base classifiers, or, you, your problem is not so simple that you can just solve it on paper and instead you give it to an optimizer uh, using something like stochastic gradient descent um, and you solve the problem there. So far at this level, this problem is not solvable. We need, uh, you know, because we don't have H. So still we need to make an assumption about H of X. I've, and if you assume that H of X is simply W transpose X, like we did for linear regression, what we get is really um, the thing that we have seen before. Um, now this is actually very interesting because there are two entirely different intellectual lineages for least squares regression. If you came from the loss minimization perspective, what you are saying is, I want to minimize the difference between the square, uh, sorry, the, I think this is, Uh, this sentence doesn't make any sense. So let what in the loss minimization sense, what we want to do is we want to minimize the the squared loss of our prediction. What that means is it's given a certain ground truth label and a prediction. If the hypothesis space consists of linear functions, I can measure the error. The error is simply y minus the prediction. And I can take the square because I want to uh, set up a nice optimization problem. And I can define this quantity to be my squared loss. And I define the learning problem to be, find the set of weights that minimizes the total squared loss. That's your least mean squares regression. That's the loss minimization perspective. Alternatively, you can come at it from a Bayesian perspective. From the Bayesian perspective, you assume that the errors are normally distributed um, and uh, uh, with a zero mean and some fixed standard deviation. And uh, applying simply working through the maximum likelihood uh, uh, process gives us exactly the same expression. So they, there are two ways to interpret the same optimization problem. And this is one of these uh, nice unifications that we will encounter once again when we see logistic regression. Or uh, you know, uh, the, the, in general, this is just another lens uh, for uh, you know, uh, analyzing or justifying learning algorithms. Either you can say that you're going to come, uh, you're going to justify your learning from the loss minimization perspective where we define what is the loss, what, what makes a classifier bad uh, in a functional form and minimize the total loss or the average loss. Alternatively, we can uh, think of it from a Bayesian perspective. One thing that is missing here is uh, 
uh, in the loss minimization perspective from the last lecture, um, or maybe, yeah, from the last lecture, I talked about a regularizer. So in loss minimization, we have empirical regularized loss uh, minimization. In the Bayesian point of view, if you want to introduce a regularizer, we will see the role that the, regular, the, the equivalent, the analogy of the regularizer here would be, you're not using the maximum likelihood estimation, uh, but actually maximum a posteriori. The prior, Forms the, serves the role of a regularizer. So let me wrap up. There are only two minutes left. And uh, while you think of questions, uh, I'll quickly summarize what we saw. Um, in Bayesian learning, Bayesian learning is just another way of asking um, this question, what does it mean to learn? What's the best hypothesis for a certain data set? There are two um, standard procedures that are uh, subsumed that, that are uh, part of Bayesian learning, which one is maximum a posteriori estimation uh, or MAP estimation. The other one is maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. Now, uh, we, we, what we saw today was two concrete examples of this maximum likelihood estimation being used. One was uh, in the context of this binomial distribution with this uh, uh, light bulb example. The other one was in the context of regression where we saw that Assuming that the noise comes from a certain normal distribution with zero mean, maximum likelihood estimation gives us essentially a Bayesian justification for the least mean square regression. Uh, in general, you should this is just a you know, template for applying uh, how this, this, this method might be applied. You should be comfortable, uh, you should be able to apply MAP and MLE for other problems also, for other tasks. And uh, this is a useful perspective. It's a useful perspective because it gives you another set of mathematical tools to analyze learning. And as a result, it might give you another set of mathematical tools that give you insight about a certain learning problem. Um, are there any questions? So in the last, so today I ended up finishing a minute before time. So I'll probably use the minute for questions. Notice, by the way, I did not talk about how to solve this optimization problem because solving this optimization problem, you can, once you come here, you can give it to some sort of, uh, say, SGD or other gradient based optimization. So, either way, we are in the same world. But there are other optimizers that also exist. It looks like there aren't too many questions. Um, ah, yes. Ah, there is, uh, based on the lecture, uh, it seems like applying MLE is more clear than MAP. Um, yes, um, because we haven't seen any examples of uh, MAP. We, well, in, on Thursday, we are going to look at logistic regression where we will actually see both MLE and MAP. And uh, we'll essentially we'll uh, look at a concrete instance of work through how MAP gets applied there. So did we just end up with what we derived two lectures ago? No, not exactly we ended up with what we derived at the in somewhere in the first half of the semester uh, for regression um, we haven't seen a bayesian uh, we haven't seen regression for a while but we did see exactly this expression before for uh, in the context of least mean square regression okay um, i'm going to stop now um, i do have office hours if you want to continue the uh, the discussion There'll be uh, just a reminder about homeworks. There's a homework for uh, that's out there right now. There'll be another homework on Thursday that will involve implementing SVM and also maybe logistic regression. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about what we saw today or anything else, uh, we can chat in office hours. Thanks.